Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've got one for you today. A legend, an actor, a comedian, a writer, a director, a presenter and one of the greatest voices in show business history. Brian Blessed, how are you? Oh, I love hearing the truth. <laughs> and the truth makes you free. Absolutely. I'm here, I'm a lovely, bright... Uh, it's midday. Uh, here I am with a, a couple of my Jack Russells fast asleep. I've taken them for a long walk. Uh, I've got uh, hundreds of animals. Uh, I'll never have any money as long as I live because all my money goes on looking after all the animals, uh, donkeys and ponies and God who knows what over the last 40 years. And we've still got plenty now. Rescuing animals everywhere. Cost me a bloody bomb and I'll never ever be rich. <laughs> but I'm rich in soul and it's it's... Wonderful to help all the animals, and so it, it's great to be here. It's great to talk to you. It's my privilege, and I've just read this new book, The Panther in My Kitchen, which is fascinating. And I wonder why we love animals so much. Is it because they're excited to see us? They're absolutely consistent in their behaviour, and their love is completely without any restriction, isn't it? They just want well, to I love think us. You said it. I think, it, to a certain extent, you're kind of symbolising the dog, isn't it? Mm. The fact that a dog gives much more that he re- than he receives. That's what it's always said, isn't it? And of course, it's true. Uh, it's very funny because I'm married to Hildegard Neal. We met uh, in the 70s. She played uh, Anthony and Cleopatra with Charles Neston. She was in The Man Who Haunted Himself mm. uh, with Roger Moore uh, and Ingrid Made Me and Touch of Clash. And I met Hildegard and we got an absolutely marvellous win. She had a great, great love of animals. But I remember her saying to me, um, you know, Brian, uh, your love of animals is amazing because I've helped with gorillas and wildlife and the World Society of Protection of Animals and Born Free and you name it and so forth. But but when it comes to dogs, Brian, you're always talking about the Mackenzie River dog, which is the most of the biggest dog in the world in Canada. It kills wolves. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and the Anatolian in Turkey, when I climbed uh, Mount Ararat, I came across all these great Anatolians who were as big as lions. <laughs> uh, strongly, again, they fought wolves. Uh, and uh, you always want this great big dog, you know. She said, I promise you one day you'll, you'll meet a little tiny dog and have a special appeal, mm-hmm. and you'll never live it down. And it, it did happen to me. She was called Misty. It was a little Jack Russell, tiny, tiny Jack Russell. Uh, when I did that, uh, Who Do You Think You Are? She's at the beginning of the film with me, sitting mm-hmm. with me. And I had her for 16 years. And I, she sat on top of my head and knocked in bed or between my legs. Hmm. And she woke up, whoa, because she had sharp claws. <laughs> she, uh, uh, and she slept with me and went with me in the studios everywhere. Uh, lots of walks. And, and she just looked at me all the time, these soft, lovely eyes. Mm. And it became the love of my life. And then after 15 years, of course, she eventually became bloody eight ounces. And that terrible day when let her go and the, the vet, lovely people with me. And she was in my arms, and she slowly, the needle was applied, and her eyes slowly closed. Mm. And it took me a fortnight to kind of talk to people. I just went in my shed, went for walks, uh, and uh, and Ellie God was quite right. I mean, uh, I've never got ever, still to this day, I've never got ever missed it. Of course, I talk about it. I do a whole chapter to Misty. Mm. I, I've written the book because it was extraordinary, and, and, and there's still a great deal of ignorance about animals and our attitude to them. When I was a kid, I mean, we went to the Johnny Wiesmuller film to see Tarzan. <clears throat> I, I was born in Mexbury, Yorkshire, halfway between Doncaster and Barnsley, a wonderful area, Don and Dern Valley, mm. uh, son of a coal miner, they all put on plays. They put on um, operas, uh, musicals, uh, all the coal miners that they could spout Shakespeare left, right and centre. Uh, I used to go on drama courses with Pat, Pat, Patrick Stewart, who was in the next village. It was kind of a, a marvellous time. Um, I've lost my way a bit there. I shouldn't have gone into the past that, that much. Uh, but um, uh, the, the thing was that the, in those days, you see, we, we, we suddenly, we, we, we dreamt of seeing a wild animal. Mm. And suddenly in the village, it was announced in 1944, as a little kid, a circus was coming to town. And it was then outside the village in fields, and we raced along, and you could hear that, oh, oh, of that strange sound that lions <laughs> make. Oh, Christ, lions! Yeah. We saw lions within two yards of us. Oh, mm. a tie. And 
some other circus has come to town? Well, just recently, of course, I helped with Annie the Elephant, finding a home for Annie the Elephant because of the cruelty. And uh, there are now, I think, 17 countries, uh, and they're stopping circuses with animals. Mm. And Britain had been rather slow to that. Bolivia was the first, uh, and now marvellous things are going on. But when I was a kid, you know, you wanted to see a wild animal. And it, it didn't, uh, I mean, even Attenborough, uh, um, uh, you know, in the 60s, was doing zoo quest to Paraguay, bringing animals back to England, of course. So we were all learning, mm. having to relearn what animals were. And, uh, and you know, now realise that a cage is a terrible thing, and et cetera. I, I, a while ago, people said, I hear you're going on a Yeti expedition. I said, yes, in four to five different parts of the world, there seems to be conclusive proof that it exists. But I would never tell you where it is. Why, Brian? Because, well, mankind would want to put him in a cage. Right. But a marvellous thing, you've got the RSPCA, <clears throat> and you've got the World Wide Life, and you've got Born Free, and all these wonderful organisations, and we're winning, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it was um, in my book, I, you know, we, I, I talk about my early days and, and having a pet. Uh, cat, Tibby, right through. I remember um, my father, the kind of love of wild animals. When I was seven years of age, my father took me to the local cinema uh, to see Jungle Book. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I think Jungle Books are out now. I mean, they're, they're fine, but nothing compared to Alexander Corders. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the acting was from Orson Welles' people, and you had Sabu. As Mowgli, amazing. And the jungles <laughs> and the animals are so real. Ah, oh, and Bagheera. Incredible. Black Panther. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and of course, many years later, when I was in Z Cars in the 60s, mm. I bought a house in Richmond and I was renovating it uh, and, and, and restoring it. Uh, I got it very cheaply. And uh, my dad came down one day and do, painting one of the rooms. And I said, Dad, I, I can never thank you enough. I owe you a debt of gratitude. Come down to the kitchen. <clears throat> and we went to the kitchen, and there, on the table, with a man called Nyoka, was the biggest female black panther one had ever seen, with green eyes. <sighs> and I, it rolled on its back. It was very tame, and I scratched its belly. And I, Come on, now, give me a hand, Dad. <sighs> and he stroked it. Thank you very much for introducing me to Jungle Book. Wow. And that, that, that panther went back to the country of origin. And so, you know, I could, you know, never thank my father enough for that. So it's in us for wild animals. We're wild ourselves, you know. Mm. But we are the guardian of this planet. And they're there for us to look after. So I do as much as I can, you know. And uh, I've helped with orangutans and helped with this, that, and the other. And a tremendous relationship with elephants and so forth. And so I find life a joy. And uh, the book is full of joy. Nevertheless, uh, there's two letters in the book from my wife. When I'm high on Mount Everest in 1993, a wonderful expedition, British one. I'm, you know, halfway up the mountain, people had really terrible monsoon conditions. And Ildegard, I put these two letters in. She said, darling, 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 I, I got a letter from you the other day from Basement Camp. Marvellous, wonderful. You climbed Island Peak and now you're setting up your high camps on Everest and, and you're in great danger. And I, I have to tell you, but I've run out of money. Uh, the ducks, are, we were waiting for the, 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 the rain to come for the, make the lawn so the ducks can <laughs> eat better. The horse is having trouble. This one's got colic. This has got bad. And so while I'm messing about going up Mount Everest with my own ego, mm. she is looking after the home and the animals and running out of money. We're almost bankrupt, darling, but I'm sure it'll be all right. I'm sure it'll be all right. I took that because the strength of mankind has always been his women. Mm. And she's the one who's running the house and running the animals that we've saved, and I'm buggering up Mount Everest. Tell me more about that. I mean, 50 years of marriage is such a remarkable achievement. How do you keep it fresh and how do you not get bored, Brian? Oh, but, 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 I don't know. She, she, she's got a fantastic imagination and fantastic uh, perception. I, I don't know any actors. I never have. I, uh, uh, my, my only acting friend is Kenneth Branagh. We have a father-son relationship. You know? mm. He's 
I'm the son, he's the father. He's such an old pillock compared to me, you know. <laughs> and he comes and sits in, in my cabin and, and we talk about his future films and what I'm going to do and my projects and mm. so forth. And Hildegard comes in and talks. And she's very intellectual uh, and, and she has a vivid imagination and she loves sport mm. and so forth. Supports Liverpool. <laughs> kind of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Uh, and and um, so she she's a woman for all seasons. She mm. takes the dogs out. She, uh, she she she's full of love and enthusiasm, mm. uh, a tremendous. And she can she handles beautifully a maniac like me, a madman like me. Do you think you are a madman? Because your reputation goes before you. You're so full of energy. I mean, when we see you on programs like Have I Got News For You, which I love, it's so great to see you being you. Are, are you a bit bonkers? A bit what, bonkers? Yes, I think it's important to be uh, reasonably mad. <laughs> it's in the film Zorba the Greek, I remember. I mentioned that film. Uh, uh, Kakyanis' film Zorba the Greek, which is a great success with Anthony Quinn mm. at Zorba. And at the end of the film, uh, there's Anthony Quinn at Zorba, and he's held on a beach uh, with the Englishman, and he said, um, I love you, boss, more than anyone else, but you have got to learn to be a little mad. <laughs> I think that, uh, I mean, I think that it's healthy madness. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I, people say to me, isn't it dangerous going up Mount Everest? Isn't it dangerous going to Aconcagua, going to the North Pole? At your age, I say the greatest danger in life is not taking the adventure. Mm. Now, I firmly believe that nature doesn't cheat. We've all got something that nobody else has got. And you've got to be allowed to bring it out. And mm. don't let the bastards grind you down. Mm. We've all got something that no one else has got. Everyone's got brilliant gifts. So, different from other people. You've got to kind of be allowed... To, to kind of fulfill your dreams. So that's what it, you know, that I, you know, but, but, um, I think that my biggest love in life is silence and meditation and stillness. I, in my adventures, I spent five days with the Dalai Lama, who was my age, doing mantras with him and going for long walks in dark and summer, uh, et cetera. I love peace. But I have a tremendous love of life. Mm. Isn't it interesting that for a man that talks a lot and is known for speaking, you love silence more than speaking? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Um, my biggest love is silence, meditation. Mm. I'm very interested in that. Uh, I've done it for years and years and years and years. Uh, uh, related in the, when I was 24 years of age to the Shankarshari of Northern India, Santanand Saraswati. And I work with the Study Society in London, a lovely society. Uh, very healthy uh, in Talgarth Road, uh, the, the, the Study Society, mm. uh, which uh, is offspring of Uspensky and people like that, and Dr. Rose. Uh, and I, cause I love all that, right? And I go and attend all kinds of meetings, different festivals mm. of different religions. I embrace what Paul said to Paul one spirit, many paths. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> One's got to be tolerant of all their own religions, haven't mm. they? But I think we're going to get there. I mean, we, you know, we are the guardian of this planet. We have to look after the animals. And, and I think we're going to get there. I do feel passionately that we, my biggest love in life is space. Mm. And I do believe, since a child, since Flash Gordon and all those things, uh, black and white films and, and so forth, uh, that in actual fact, we are the children of stardust, yearning for the stars. Hmm. And we, 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 we're very, very young. And people say to me, Brian, because I finished training in Moscow, space training, and on Reunion Island in, in the Pacific with NASA. Uh, you know, and I said, Brian, you'd never get me. <laughs> I'm going into space in a rocket ship. I said, you've got no choice. I said to an audience. <laughs> I said, you're on rocket ship Earth. You're traveling at 57,000 miles a second. So every time you wake up, in a different part of the universe. Mm. And the whole of the solar system and the whole of the Milky Way is expanding at, at that speed. I think we haven't begun yet. We, I think we're going to do well. We'll travel to the other planets. It's just the beginning. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, I would, you know ad admire uh, the spirit of mankind. I think that we have hope. I was in Pandora, isn't it? 
she um, uh, she und- undid the box and the Furies came out yes. and created hell. Yes. And, uh, and then she closed the lid and a voice said, let me out, let me out, let me out, you've locked me in. <laughs> and she opened it up and out came this iridescent angel and said, I am hope. I am hope. Mm. So when you see Trump and you see all these different things, we are going to make it. What do we do about people like him? Do we treat them with contempt? Do we ignore them? Do we embrace them? Or do we just get well, on with it and I ignore think them? You ignore because I think, uh, you know, um, the monkey gets bigger. You know what I mean? Um, hmm. you know, when I said, it's just a mystic one day, a, a student wanted to be with this great mystic. Hmm. And he said, I see. He said, and I want to control my mind. Oh, do you? And on your way here, did you see anything? Well, I saw, I saw a green parrot. Oh, well, go in that room with there and get that parrot out of your mind. And after about two hours, you go, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's worse. The parrot's getting bigger. <laughs> and I think if you give him too much attention, the parrot will get bigger. Mm. I mean, yeah. he is um, uh, a frightful arsehole. Uh, uh, what is astonishing is that <laughs> when I... He's a total twat and pillock. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, uh, um, when I was at drama school and everywhere else... And, and NASA, working with NASA, Golombek, a sophisticated American professor or scientist takes some beating f- for refinement. Mm. How can they cough up Trump? He's an appalling <laughs> creature. Yes. You have a beautiful now, way I with words. Remotely is in charge. He's a clown. He's a fool. Mm. He's a total, absolute twat. But doesn't it sum up the celebrity culture that a man that was judging people on The Apprentice can end up president of America? <laughs> I have to say that frequently, I think Dickie Bryce before he died, Richard Bryce, because I said, he said, you never seem to say anything good about taxes. I said, well, I don't say anything derogatory. I said, all right, Richard, I will. And of course, I can be objective about taxes probably more than anybody else because right. I'm an explorer. Yeah. And so I said, you know, that uh, uh, I think that acting is the toughest of all the arts. Hmm. Um, because in opera, you can say, which I was trained operatically, you can uh, say, oh, my voice is not very good today. I've got a bit of a cold. Or a ballet dancer can, can say, well, I've pulled a muscle. I'm quite good in ballet today. But in acting, your, your body, your, your eyes, your voice, hmm. your mind, your imagination, your heart, your soul is hmm. judged. And 99% of the time, you're shot down. You've got to have the courage and next day to go back on the stage or go back in front of a camera hmm. or walk the streets and get over it. Yes. It's tough. But as Hamlet says, acting is holding up the mirror up to nature, hmm. holding up the mirror up to life. But of course, climbing is life. And there's a huge difference. Nevertheless, I feel that it's an incredibly tough uh, art uh, to follow and a uh, tremendous admiration for it, you know. Uh, but, it, but in the end, it's a fabulous art, but you are pretending. So when actors say, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't do the performance stayed with me all night and then when I got home, oh, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> when you finish rehearsal, then go home. I interviewed a Phantom of the Opera once on Broadway who said he never opened his curtains at home because he wanted to keep in the role, and you think that's taking it a little too far. Oh, you silly bugger. <laughs> you silly bugger. <laughs> don't, 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 don't be so pretentious and crabby. Well, that's cool. <laughs> no, no, actors are no different than anybody else. You're all actors. Nobody acts. Yeah, you have we to do. act every day. You have to be a diplomat every bloody day. Yep. What the politicians need to remind themselves about is there's a difference between debating and argument. Hmm. When two people argue, both are wrong. Right. You debate. Yeah. Don't argue. Don't we don't argue. seem to like people having an opinion now. I think social media sort of created this society where if you don't follow a certain agenda and a certain narrative, you're, you're the enemy. And, and that worries me because debate is what makes the world right. Because not everybody's right, not everybody's wrong. Somewhere in the middle is probably the truth. Uh, yes, that's right. You said it. You, you said it, man. You mm. said it. Absolutely. Well, I should be careful about identification. Remember the green parrot. Uh, the identify, identifying wrong identification and so forth. Um, I, I think that I didn't, you know, that we people want everything. Mm. Uh, it, it, uh, it's fascinating that um, uh, 
when I was with the Dalai Lama, I said, to, 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 what do you want? I said, to, I, I, are your objective to burst the bubble of the universe, like Buddha, and become self-realized? He said, and to become self-realized, he said, um, for me, is to desire nothing. You mean to tell me the objective is nothing? Yes, because everybody wants everything, and it keeps us prisoners. Anyway, mm. that's all very deep. Uh, but never, Tell me about how your friendship started with the Dalai Lama. I mean, he well, seems I like an incredibly you, funny man as well. Well, I, I, when I first went to Everest, I made the film Galahad at Everest. Mm. Galahad, of course, was George E. Maui, who disappeared on Everest in 1924. Uh, and uh, that expedition in 1924, the best expedition ever mounted on God's earth, uh, was blessed by the 13th Dalai Lama. And so, when I was making the film Following Maori's Footsteps in 1989, mm. with a team of everyone's in it, the best climbers, Americans, Russians, they're all, everyone's in it, uh, and so forth, uh, the Dalai Lama, we asked him that he is the 14th now, would he repeat his predecessor and bless me as I was going up in Maori's room? And he said, yes. And he's my age, and that's how I met him. Uh, and um, it was amazing, and the fact that um, I was there for a few days. And, of course, uh, prior to me going there, um, uh, all the professors and people are, oh, you're here, you're going to be the Dalai Lama. He's blessed, blessed by the Dalai Lama, and all that. He's going to repeat the ceremony, is it? Well, I'd love you to ask him a few questions, because I've... You know, I've got many theories about uh, 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 about reincarnation. You know, I think it'd be very interesting. I said, no. What is not interested in reincarnation? He will not talk about it. All he will talk about is love. That's what I'm looking for. It's only interested in love. Anyway, I met him. Now, it's funny. I haven't talked this way for a long time. Uh, you know, in life, <laughs> we're always being kind of political in the fact that uh, we're being diplomatic and we lie in silence mm. times now when you meet the Dalai Lama you actually become wonderfully honest uh, and I find myself almost being rude with him um, it was very strange because people were always giving him you know bowing and scraping to him yep. well I didn't I wasn't being arrogant about that that's fine I'll bow and scrape why not mm. I don't need you of course and so forth. But when I got there, he's my age, and I suddenly had, you know, I find it was my job to slightly con him. Right. So you become very <laughs> honest. And so he's trying to come into film, mm. and there well, I'm with the BBC team, I'm with David Bashirs, who does all those IMAX films, the great American climber and filmmaker. And we're all sat there. Uh, Can I come in now? No, out, out, keep out, keep out. <laughs> And patience, patience, show the Dalai Lama. Learn some patience. Oh, oh. <laughs> and the translator said, No one talks to his holiness like this. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> never it. Oh, it's all right, man. Oh, God, come on. And he, eventually he came. Oh, you can come in, come in. No, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and anyway, and I, I said, <laughs> so I'm sat with him, you know, and the translator said, uh, Mr. Blessed, your head is much higher than his holiness. Uh, you must lower your head, just get sit further down in your chair. And, and Delarme said, oh, no, it doesn't matter. Let him do what he likes. It doesn't matter. Because you know, <laughs> you're supposed to have your head slightly lower if you're in the audience with him. Mm. And there it was. And, I, you know, I, so, um, so I said, you know, by the way, what did I say to him? I, I, um, there was a translator there. He doesn't need a translator. He's there for security. Uh, and I said, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I said, you, you know, you're my age. At the time, I was 57, 55. Right. He was 55. Uh, and he, he said, uh, I said, but you know, I mean, have, have you gone on the sex? <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> no one asks his holiness this question. <laughs> but how are you skins him on the I mean, I'm 55. I'm still Randy. Randy, I still like the women, I said. I said to my shag anything, shag anything that moves. <laughs> and, oh, oh, just, as, but as you can only, I'm, I'm always, oh, you're not without sex. How have you gone on? <laughs> See, these are the questions that people want to ask, don't they? And he said, I am so, no, it's true. Ah, oh, Mr. Blessed, sometimes I think of beautiful.
beautiful woman. I do my mantras louder and take a cold shower. <laughs> practical, practical, but oh yes, 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 I do, and so forth. And so it was like that all the way through with him, you know. That, um, <laughs> I, I talked to a million, a million different things like that, you know, and um, etc. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the Chinese to him, you know, I said, the Chinese are giving you a rough time. Yes, yes. Uh, but apparently, well, the most unfortunate to Dalai Lama, because you lost a country, mm. and the most fortunate, because you've been given the opportunity to forgive your enemy. Mm. Have you forgiven the Chinese? Ah, interesting, you see, love life. Love child, love dog. Very easy. Love your enemy. This acid test, Brian. This is acid test. Wow. And you love the Chinese. Oh, yeah. You do realize that they're gathering women in their hundreds in Tibet and sterilizing them. Wow. They're going to wipe you out. Wow. And he, went, he looked at me and said, yes, but they are unhappy in Tibet. It's too high for them. They suffer the Chinese. <laughs> he was incredibly impressive. Wow. And so, I, so he said, uh, uh, so eventually, <laughs> as I said, I was conning him. I was getting things out of him. You know what I mean? Having him fall into traps, and he knew it, and he liked it. He liked and the tea. enthusiastic. Mm. And so I then said, well, I'm now, you're going to bless me like your predecessor. Cause the predecessor was the 13th. He's the 14th. And you're going to bless me like he blessed Mary. Yes, 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 yes. Right. <laughs> I'm going to bless you too. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, well, uh, I said, it was interesting because in 1924, Mary's expedition, the great personality with General Bruce, who was my build and was powerful and was, he begat the Gurkhas and he was a hero of the Dardanelles and he was incredibly powerful like Hercules. Yes, yes, yes. We used to get his head, put it on a chair, and his feet on another chair. And me and my monks, we couldn't bend his spine. <laughs> and I had him talk like that for 20 minutes about General Bruce. Wow. And I said, but your holiness, you are the 13th Dalai Lama. Oh. I'm talking about 1924. You were born in 1936, like me. <gasps> You are a naughty boy. I never talk about reincarnation. But you just describe for 20 minutes for activities with General Bruce. Wow. He said, yes, yes. I have five times been Dalai Lama. Wow. But I've not been the best one, Mr. Blessed. We got on like a house. I spent How time amazing. Day. I meditated with him. I went walks with Darin Salma. It's woods and trees, mm. people... It's sensational. Um, it, 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 uh, kids are flying kites everywhere. It is bliss. Idyllic. Yeah. So go to Darwin Summer. Go there. Go there. And in the streets and everywhere, you know. They knew I was going to meet him, and he gave me a big tanker. Do you know a tanker like a painting? Yeah. For a long life. And now and again, I see him, you know. I must ask you the question then, Brian, at the age of 81, are you still Randy? Oh, very. <laughs> oh, Christ, I remember my dad. When he was 98, I said, I think, well, what's it like being old, Daddy? I don't know what you mean by old, Rat. I'm not old. I'm still me. And I said, you scared. Well, Dad, get any inclinations at night. Well, well, yes, you never lose that, you know. <laughs> the wind, but I'm not part of the E Club. Well, what's that, Dad, in Yorkshire? Well, all the old men sit on a bench and a beautiful woman walks past and they all go, E. <laughs> <laughs> what I could have done. E I'm not part of the bloody E club. <laughs> I'm not part of the bloody E club. No, I do not know. I'm a very randy lad. I've already pulled me salads and all this, that and the other. Oh, Christ, now. Give the ghost upstairs, don't be bollocks. <laughs> no, man, I'm, I can still shake anything that bloody moves. Oh, this is marvellous. And how do we avoid temptation? Because you're a very attractive man, Brian. Delicious. <laughs> How do I avoid temptation? Well, I'm madly in love with you, God. I'm insanely in love with my wife. Isn't that lovely? I mean, look at her as Claire Patrick. Go and have a, I mean, through the years that she's got, oh, she gets more beautiful. And she uh, a wonderful sense of humour and delight. And she rejoices in my madness. Mm. Um, um, it, 
I, I, what was it Cervantes said? And they said to him, you know, that you're mad, Cervantes, the professor said. And, and he said, um, madness, who knows where madness lies? Perhaps to be too practical, maybe madness. To surrender dreams, maybe madness. To seek treasure, where there is only trash. Too much sanity, maybe madness. <laughs> and maddest of all, to see life as it is and not as it should be. I wish I'd bloody written that. Oh, beautiful. No, you've got to be, because that's where sanity lies. Mm. That's where wisdom lies. And we're all faking trying to be normal, aren't we, really? Well, we can become very mechanical, can't we? Mm. But yeah. you're not. No, I've loved every second of this man, chat. You're alive, you're awake. And you the Buddha. Mm. When the Buddha broke through the, the, the bubble of the universe, he broke through it, and um, he, everyone looked at him with his amazing eyes. And he walked from under the bobo tree. And they said to him, are you a king? <laughs> are you a prince? <laughs> no, no. Are you a god? No, no. What are you, he said. I am awake. Oh, nice. Nice. In your projects that you love, yeah. then you break, you burst the bubble of the universe, and you wake. You have moments of wakeness. They're, they're peak experience. Mm. Suddenly, one day you're walking. It might be music. It might be lovemaking. It might be your dog. Suddenly, mm. you know something that your education has not taught you. Mm. Isn't it true that the two greatest things you can be in life is present and awake? Because if you're the in the room but not right, there... There you are, my old son. Yeah, yeah, interesting. By the way, uh, I, I don't mean this commercially, I directed the mill at Sonning and the Hollow, Echo the Christie and, and Spider's Web, and I'm now starting next week, uh, part of my relaxation. I'm rehearsing her favourite play, and uh, the mill at Sonning, uh, The Unexpected Guest. It's amazingly romantic hmm. mystery. I've got a fabulous cast, so I start rehearsing on Monday, uh, and then uh, three and a half weeks later, we're at the Millet Sonic. Fantastic. I've been playing the other two productions I did, broke box office records, and this will too. Do you have any ego about being a director and not being on stage? Does it matter? Oh, not at all. No, I love, I love being a servant. Interesting. Yeah, mm. that's selfless, isn't it? Because there's no yeah. glory in it, because they're getting the round of applause. They said that to you. I don't know, that's two bombers. Is uh, they said <laughs> 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 when you die, you will be the leader. Yes. And he said, he is servant to the rest. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm going to oh, I'll, I'll make one of you a king. I'll give you robes. I'll give it in some jewels. And you can be all. Oh. Yeah. Fantastic. Servant to the rest. And of course, this uh, autumn, you'll be back on the uh, road from September doing more live shows, most of which have been a sellout. Come Incredible. And the lovely thing is, which is great fun, is, is for the World Cup, I'm going to do a lot of adverts. Because I've got to feed all these animals and earn money. Uh, so I never have any money to scratch me off. So it all goes to pay for the animals. <laughs> but you'll see me on television riding a great big Russian bear uh, for the Russian Olympics, uh, for the Russian World Cup. Very good. A big, a big, big Russian bear <laughs> with me on its back. Because <laughs> I love football. When do we get to see that? I can't wait. Uh, that, that will be on very soon. I'll film it this week. Brilliant. So I want to get it on very quickly because the World Cup starts very quickly. It's a preamble to the World Cup with me as a, with the Russian bear. Show business is a uh, an interesting game. Be careful with bears. They can eat you, Brian. Just be they careful. Can. You'll be back on the road from the 29th of June with the Audience With Tour in Leeds. I'm going to come and see you there. Then to Brighton in July. September, Scunthorpe, Newcastle, Cambridge, Birmingham, Basingstoke, Warrington, uh, New Brighton. And then through October, through Yeovil on the 19th, you'll be on the road. You can find out more details by putting in an audience with Brian Blessed. And the new book is out now as well, which is fabulous, called The Panther in My Kitchen. You are a legend and you are a star and a blessed life, I guess, Brian Blessed. Thank you. You've been very kind to me. I loved it. Very kind. That's, that's quite wonderful. Thank you. That's, that's the best interview I've ever had. Oh, you're very kind. Thank I you for your time. Like that. You're a star. Thank you, Brian.